All right, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. Well, we've got a pretty good group. Looks good. Hopefully we can have a uh, productive question and answer session. Uh, for those of you you are not familiar with me, I am the Doe Doctor, Tom Lehman. Uh, I write a column in Pizza Today magazine called The Doe Doctor. So uh, I'll try to answer, uh, today I'm going to try to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, regarding dough formulation. Please don't ask me an operations question. There are much better people out there than I am. But uh, if you got a dough issue, a processing issue, dough management, and by the way, dough management, uh, what is, what's he talking about, dough management? I got a manager. Uh, no, dough management is everything that happens to your dough from the time that it's mixed until the time that you open it up into a skin. That's dough management. So if you're having some issues with that, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll try to address those issues for you. While we've been waiting here, I've had a couple questions already come up. Uh, and uh, I'll share the, the first one here. You, you've got a new mixer. The it's, it's a larger mixer. You've gone to a larger size mixer. Uh, planetary or spiral? Spir spiral. All right. And you're growing into the spiral from a planetary or another it's smaller? Spiral. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you've gone from a 60 quart to 120 quart. Boy, you got a good business going there. Uh, need a partner? <laughs> That's a lot of dough, folks, 140, 140 quart. Uh, okay, and the question was on, on blooming the yeast? Yeah, before when we would make the dough, we could, you know, we had the water stayed warm enough that you bloom the yeast in the bowl, mixing bowl itself. But now when you try and do it, the bowl is so big and it's cold back there in the kitchen. Uh -huh. It takes the water temperature down too much and then the yeast will activate. Okay. This is a common, this is a common issue. Uh, and I come across this quite frequently. I don't know where the idea started from, but there is a misconception that when you uh, activate or bloom the yeast, and you're using active dry yeast hopefully, uh, that you have to do it in all of the water. You know, we, we say that we, we try to bloom it in 100 degree water. Um, yeah, but my doughs always come out so hot when I do that. Well, no, you only bloom it in a small amount of water. How much water do you need? About five times the weight of the yeast. So if, you, if you're only scaling out, let's say one ounce, or say two ounces, be realistic. Two ounces of active dry yeast Five times two is 10. So you only need to use about 10 ounces of water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit to bloom it. That's all. The rest of the water would be cold going into your mixer because it's your water temperature that predetermines what the finished dough temperature is going to be. That's the only mechanism that you have to adjust it. So otherwise, your doughs are going to be too cold. And as you're finding out, you're trying to bloom it in warm water, all of the water. But the bowl is so big now and it has, so, it has such a capacity for cooling that down, that'd be like pouring a cup of water over an iceberg and complaining that it's cooling the water. Makes terrible yeah. yeah. So what you want to do is just take a small plastic bowl or a metal bowl and put the water in first. No more than 105 degree water. Now, what do I see? Okay. Over, turn on the tap. Mm, yeah, that feels about 105. <laughs> or that feels, yeah, that's 100. What temperature is that? What temperature is that? Can somebody tell me? 98.6. Why, wow, you're really good at temperature differentiation. 98.6. Let's see, 98.6. be 90. So 1. You can tell the difference that that water is 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than your fingertip, right? Come on, you know you can't, and I do too, the secret's out. Okay, use your thermometer. But Tom, we don't have a thermometer. Okay, we'll keep that just between you and I. <laughs> if, if you've got a store that's licensed, you've got a thermometer. And either that or I want to talk to your health inspector. <laughs> right? Am I right or wrong? Yeah, all right. 
One, one other thing, too, I'll just mention this about, about thermometers. Uh, there's good ones and there's bad ones. What's a good one? <laughs> Any thermometer tells you the right temperature, okay? What's a bad one? All the others. Uh, that aside, you don't need to go out and spend $200 for a thermocouple and, you know, box and a probe. I got, I got one that I used to travel with, and they, they hassle me so much on the airlines because it's a receiving unit about that big square, and it's got a coiled extension cord about two feet long, then it's got a probe on the end of it. You know what it looks like? It looks just like a C4 detonator. <laughs> <laughs> and I just got tired of having that little piece of paper in there saying that we had to open your bag and inspect it. Uh, so I finally just left that at home. <clears throat> that unit costs 150 bucks. You don't have to do that. Go on the internet and just Google stem or dial type thermometers. I, I just did it recently. You can get them for about four bucks. The only thing you want to make sure you do is look underneath the head. If you've got a round head, and look underneath the head, and there should be a hex nut underneath the head. It's not there for decoration. If you firmly grasp that head, and then put a small wrench on that hex nut, you can turn it, and you can recalibrate it. If it does not have that hex nut, buy one that does, because it cannot be calibrated. Do I like electronic ones? Yeah, they're good. The only problem with them is that when they go out of calibration, you either throw it away or you send it back to the manufacturer for recalibration, okay? So I'm not real fond of the electronic ones. Just the old bimetallic strip dial type thermometers work great. I recently bought one at AutoZone. It has a range of, a, of uh, goes from uh, 25 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Duh, perfect for our dose. And, uh, Huh, now you got me confused, huh? Why, why would they have those thermometers at, for pizza dough at Donald's own? Well, all they do is they just relabel it. It doesn't say for dough. It says for checking the temperature of your air conditioning, for the temperature of the air blowing through your air vents. That's what they use them for. Then they're cheap. Oh, by the way, did I fail to mention that, all, that Walmart also has it for three-something? <laughs> so, anyhow, thing is, don't spend a lot of money on a, on a thermometer. You don't need it. Uh, but just buy a good one and calibrate it periodically. Check the calibration of it. And the easiest way to check the calibration, uh, a lot of people use ice water, right? I don't like to use ice water. And uh, any, any of you here when you're in school have any science classes or anything? And you ever work in a scientific <laughs> discipline? You know, we had to work with carefully calibrated instruments you know that if you calibrate your instrument as close as possible to the temperature that you're going to be working at, it's going to be more accurate. All right? So if you calibrate your thermometer to be accurate at 500 degrees, it's not going to be super accurate at 32 degrees, and vice versa. Huh. If you go to your local pharmacy and buy an oral thermometer, you know the kind you stick under your tongue? Just buy one of those and put it into a, a, a cup and I like to use oil. You can just use salad oil, whatever you want. Uh, just put a piece of uh, 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 foil over the top of the container. Don't use glass. Got to be plastic, remember? No glass in our shop. Uh, but just fill it with oil. And then go ahead and put a piece of foil over it. If you don't have foil, get yourself a Walmart bag. Put it over the top of it. Secure it with a rubber band. Poke a hole. Stick that oral thermometer in it. And what temperature is that designed to read most carefully at, most accurately at? 98.6. Right. And so all you're going to do is you're going to read the temperature on that, and it'll be something 80 to 90 to 100, something in that range. Stick your other thermometer in right next to it, your dial-type thermometer, and check the temperature. If they're reading the same temperature, you're home free. Take it out and start using it. If not, then adjust your dial thermometer, recalibrate it, wipe it off, and you're good to go. Okay? Most of these, they sell them with, they're called a, a, a protector, and it's a sleeve. It's, it's nothing more than a pla hard plastic tube. If you bend the spike on that, 
the stem is it's called. If you bend that, I guarantee you it's out of calibration. So always stick it back into that. Don't let your people walk around with it in their pockets. That's not the place to carry it in the shop. Uh, keep it in the drawer. Uh, some of them you can secure it to the wall. Okay? But use it. And you're going to use it on your dough, you're going to use it on your water temperature. Okay? So make sure you get a, a thermometer, get, get one that's not lying to you. Make sure it's calibrated, keep it in calibration, you're good to go. We have another question over here. Did that answer your question? Yes, Great. Did it, you had a question too? Uh, I mean, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you how the, like, the shop temp and humidity affect just the overall shop temp. Oh, okay. Shop temp and humidity affect the, uh, just the, dough, making process. the dough making process. Okay. The, the shop temperature really, unless it's... Uh, Unless you're, yeah. Uh, unless your shop is unusually warm, uh, over 85 degrees. If your kitchen's over that, back where you're making dough, it's it's not going to have a whole lot of effect on it. But 85 is the threshold. Check your flour temperature. That's going to have a great the greatest impact. That's going to have the greatest impact on finished dough temperature. And for a lot of us, though, you know, because of where we store uh, our flour, we may have done racks in back near the mixer where we store our flour on. So in some cases, our flour temperature is going to be that which the room temperature is back where we're doing our dough mixing. In that case, you could, by, by default, you could say that, yeah, room temperature would be important because room temperature and flour temperature run together. So just check your flour temperature. That's the important thing. There's a, a rule. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. You can. You know, flour can be stored under adverse conditions. Um, you, you never know when when where flour has been stored. Uh, I've I've seen flour stored at over 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which has actually damaged the protein of the flour, uh, and the flour was really performing funky. Uh, winter time. Uh, some shops, you just receive your flour. Um, you know, we're in that time. Anybody here from a colder climate? Okay. When you get a flour delivery in, are those bags warm or cold? They're cold. <coughs> did you ever get into that flour soon after you re received it? Or did you, did you leave it set for three, four, five days before you used it? If you, if you used it right away, you're probably probably using cold flour, okay? And that flour temperature then will have a cooling effect on the dough. Do you know how long it takes for flour to equilibrate to room temperature? A bag, 50 pound bag? Minimum of three days. And that's if it's just either standing up or sitting out, <laughs> not stacked up. If it's stacked up, you reduce the surface area so it takes even longer. It can take as long as seven days for that flour to come to room temperature. So, for storing flour, yeah. there is none. Well, I mean, for making it at the right temperature, like you want it warmer than 40, 50 degrees. For, uh, I'm not sure I'm following your. You want your flour to be warmer than what temperature? Oh, uh, no, you don't. We're, all we're trying to do with, with flour is we're just measuring the temperature. We don't want to adjust the flour temperature. That's, that's not what we're trying to do. Cold flour, I can say this. If you receive flour that's cold, and Tom, define cold under 40 degrees. Cold flour will tend to absorb water more slowly than warm flour. So let's go back. You just received a flour shipment. And it's it's been zero and below zero, and your flour is cold. Quick, dirty test on it is take your thermometer and just stick your thermometer into through the bag, and get a temperature on the flour. And if you say, "Holy moly, it won't even read on my thermometer; it's that cold." Okay, so now let's assume we got cold flour, and I need to use it right away. So you scale it out, put it in a bowl, and you start mixing. 
And the first thing that's going to cross your mind is, holy moly, something went wrong. Did I misscale my flour? Did I misscale the water? Your dough is probably going to look slack, and it may even feel sticky when it comes off the mixer. Don't worry. That is normal for a cold flour. It just doesn't want to absorb that water as fast. It will. So don't panic. Just realize that if you're using cold water, the flour, or if you're using cold flour, that flour will absorb water at a significantly slower rate than warmer flour will. That, that's all you have to re realize. The absorption will not change. Okay? So but, you don't want to keep adding flour to get it to consume no, no. it right. when you use it, it's going to There you go. And that's the point I'm trying to get across. Okay. We don't see too much of that anymore, but uh, 10 years ago we saw that. You know, oh, the dough felt soft and sticky, so I added some more flour. Did I do bad? Well, tell me, how did the dough come out? All the dough didn't come out good at all. <laughs> so, yeah, we knew we'd done wrong. Uh, so just bear with it. It'll, it'll catch up to you. Uh, normally, you've got a good indication that, that this is present if you look at your finished dough temperature, because your dough temperatures are going to be colder than normal. For most of us, we're going to be looking at Finished dough temperature off the mixer, probably a low of 75 to a high of probably 85. Just within that narrow range, that's, that's what we're looking at. And depending upon how you're managing your dough, the size of the dough, the type of dough you've got, these are all going to influence what works for you for a finished dough temperature. We've got a rule that we try to follow and in dough management. And, and that is that if you are mixing and then scaling and balling and then boxing or bagging and then placing the dough into the cooler, be a reach-in or a walk-in, and you're going to give it cold fermentation time, 24, 48, 72, 96 hours, whatever, you should have that entire dough processed and in the cooler within 20 minutes of coming off the mixer. So if the mixer stopped at 9 a.m. and we took the dough out at 9 a.m. and we put it up on a bench at 9.20, I should not see anybody cutting, scaling, balling, or anything else. All that dough should be residing in the cooler at 9.20. So if we take longer than that, is it okay if we stack it so the cooler cools down the dough cold temperature? Well, what you're going to do is when you when you take when you ball it, like in the walk-in, if I stack it so the cooler hits it, so it doesn't like freak this fast. Okay. It out. Well, here's what here's what we do when you when you box it up. Okay, that just goes a, a typical scenario. Mix it, take it straight over to the bench, and we start cutting, scaling, and then we have our guys balling it up and then we're putting it into dough boxes. I like to wipe the top of the dough balls just with a little bit of oil. Just get a coating of oil over the top of the dough balls. As soon as we get these, our dough boxes filled, get them into the cooler, but when you put them in the cooler, do not, do not stack them one on top of each other. Always cross stack them. Okay, so each one is perpendicular to the one above and below it. And the reason why we do this is because it allows heat to escape from that dough box. If you don't, you're just trapping that heat in there. So, and you're creating a dead air space within that box, and yeast is alive. It's, it's, it's a living organism. And it is metabolizing sugar or nutrients. And during metabolism, it's also creating heat, which is commonly known as heat of metabolism. And that heat is to the power of about one degree per hour. So every hour, it's trying to generate one degree additional heat unless that heat is extracted from that dough some way. So when you cover it, what starts happening inside the dough box? Sweat. It keeps getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And we know that temperature is the number one driver of fermentation of any microorganism. Remember that thermometer we were talking about? That's why your health inspector is so hung up on a thermometer. That's why if you've got a, a, a salad bar, they're there poking stuff and making sure it's cold because pathogens go faster 
at higher temperatures than they do at lower temperatures, and yeast is a pathogen. It's a microorganism, okay? So it's affected by, by the temperature. So then what happens is that the box cools off, right? Eventually the box will cool off because it's exposed to the temperature inside the cooler. Well, when the box cools off and the air is moist and damp inside the box, what happens to that moisture inside the box? You get condensate. It condenses against the inside the box and now it begins to drip off. And so now it drips down onto the pizza, and, oh, not a problem, yeah. Falls back onto the dough, and it's absorbed par partially into the dough. And let's say you're gonna use it after 24 hours. Well, you may say, yeah, yeah, the dough is a little bit sticky, but hey, dusting flour works. All, there are droplets of water on that dough, so right underneath the surface of the dough, you've got extremely high areas of moisture concentration. All right, now you open up your skin, life is good, right? You make a pizza out of it, and you look in the oven, and if it's a deck oven, you say, uh, hey George, give me that bubble popper. What causes bubbles? Steam, okay, you get, just get droplets of water in there that are in the dough, you don't see it, you may not even know they're present, but you sure know it if you look at your box. And you also know it because you don't feel sticky and slimy when it comes out of the box. If you're just a cross stack it, you won't get that. You're not going to get that at all. You got a question? Yeah, so um, having that problem you're talking about, is, is it staggering? How long does it stagger? Okay, good question. Because we're using a cool room, so we'll have probably like 10 stacks of dough, 10 gallons of dough at one time. So like 24 hours maybe? Well, no. no we, did, we, did, we did some work. On, on stacking of the dough a number of years ago. And what we found, and these are just rough numbers, it, it'll vary a little bit, but just real rough numbers. Uh, let's start out with the smaller weight first. 10 ounces. Now it doesn't make, you know, what if I've got 10 and a half ounces, does it change it? You know, if you want to get scientific, yeah. If you got 10.1 ounces, it changes it, but you know, we're not making rocket fuel or nitroglycerin, we're making pizza dough. so. If it's 10 ounces, give or take an ounce on either side, uh, it's going to take two hours cross stack time. And what you're looking for, write this down. How do I know when they've been cross stacked long enough? <laughs> you beat me to it. Good, good. I appreciate that. You go back to that thermometer. You stick a thermometer into the dough. Don't, don't, fla don't flash it with an infrared. It won't work. Stick it into the dough. Measure the temperature, and the magic number that you're looking for is 50 degrees. When that reaches 50 degrees, ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready for downstacking. You can then, it's called downstacking because you take the top box and you bring it down. And if you feel bold and venturesome, you can try to do the whole stacking. Yeah. Normally what happens is all of a sudden we hear a clatter coming from the cooler, and then we hear some choice four letter words, and a guy comes out all sheepish, and you say, oh, what happened, George? And he says, oh, the whole stack fell down. <laughs> so, so we refer to it as down stacking. That's where we take the top, we put it to the bottom on a new stack, and we rebuild the stack. But this time they're nesting or covering each other, 50 degrees. And then if, we're, if, you're, if you're a little bit heavier on your dough weights, uh, if you're about 14 ounces, it's, it's going to take rough numbers three hours. Rough numbers three hours. Look at, anticipate three hours. But again, check it with that thermometer. If it's 16 ounces, uh, you're going to be looking at three and a half to four hours. Cross stack time. That, that is typical. Okay. And, and like I say, it can be a little bit longer. I don't know what temperature your dough came off at, and that's why I don't know. You know, if you got, if I've got two pots of water, both, and one one pot is at 200 degrees and the other one's at 160, one's going to cool off faster than the other one, obviously. So, use that thermometer to check it when it reaches 50 degrees. That is a good, safe bet that you're safe now that you can go ahead, down stack them, put them up, kiss them goodnight, and they'll be ready to bring out 24. 48, 72, 96 hours, whatever it is. And they're not going to blow. Uh, they're not going to all grow together. 
uh, if you say, well, gee, our, our dough has a tendency to all want to grow together, the next day we got one giant big piece of dough, and it's really a pain to have to cut them apart and dig them out. Yeah, you're not leaving them cool down enough because they're warming up and continuing to ferment. Yesterday in my presentation, yesterday morning, uh, anybody was in that presentation yesterday? I'll pick on you. What was that three-letter word I told you to ask? Why? 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 Por qué? Por qué? Swahili. Okay. Why? What, what's so important about that 50 degrees? Well, at 50 degrees, yeast begins to go, begins to go dormant at 45. What would happen if you left the cross stack too long and now it came down to 40 degrees in the cooler? It won't ferment. So you're going to come back to it 24 hours later, and you're going to say, huh, did we forget the yeast? Because <laughs> dough balls are going to look real similar to the way they went in. So they're not going to have the anticipated fermentation. Remember, why are we putting them in the cooler? And we just want to get long, slow fermentation. We're trying to develop a flavor profile from that. So by leaving them cooled down to 50 degrees, they're still going to continue to ferment, but at a slower rate. Okay. Is there any case where 55 would be a better temperature? If it works for you, if it gives you what you want, of course. Uh, again, 50 degrees is just a good starting point. I would say that 45 is probably too low. The only time I use 45 degrees is if we were in a scenario where you told me that, look, I've got seven outlying stores, and I have to put them in a truck, and for some reason I've got to ship dough balls from this store to a store three hours down the road and they want to hold it for another three days, four days after they receive it. Then I, I might want to maybe drop the temperature lower and to get less fermentation on it because during distribution the dough is going to tend to warm up a little bit and then they're going to want to be able to put it in the cooler and store it some more. So I got to drop my temperature. I got to control my temperature. Dough management. So I'm just managing fermentation. But 50 degrees, that's what you're looking for. Well, I have kind of a, a unique situation, and I'm a small, I don't have restaurants, so I don't have big coolers and things like that. So um, I'm not able to use, I'm not able to cross stack. I was wondering, is there. You got a reach in? No, I have a, a fridge, a regular fridge. Okay. So is there, is there a an issue with bulk fermenting because it's a lot easier to bulk ferment in my fridge than to ball or put them in stacks. Yeah. Um, what I have been doing is bulk fermenting and then bulk. Bulk fermenting and putting it in the fridge is akin to spitting in the ocean and calling it polluted. <laughs> <laughs> um, why? Um, okay. Here you've got bulk fermentation taking place. How big is your dough? Ooh, dough weight or flour weight? Uh, flour weight. Flour weight. Uh, so 1.7. So you get about 17, 18 pounds of dough. Okay, that's that's a slug of dough. You're putting it into a fridge in bulk. All right. Regardless how big your your container is, it's not going to slow it down very much because as dough continues to ferment, it becomes an excellent insulator. Excellent insulator. On a cold day, you could wear it if you could figure some way to stabilize it. So. It's such a good insulator that putting it in, the only thing you're going to do is cool down the outer edges of it. And that's it, nothing else. You're wasting refrigeration space. You're better off just doing it at room temperature and managing your fermentation with finished dough temperature. All right? Now, how long do you try to hold it? Usually make it at night and then have use it by, I was doing it at lunch at a farmer's market, so I'd make it at 5 on a Friday night, keep it in the fridge about 5 in the morning, I'd ball it and use it around. And so you're balling it on premise? Balling it on, uh, at, at, at home. Okay. And then you, you're taking them over to the farmer's market? You're not refrigerating them? No, from there. Okay. It's just in the yeah. insulated bag. If, if, if it was me, uh, I'd be making up that dough uh, using compressed yeast. Okay. I would be using all of my water. Uh, I would probably set my water temperature at... 45 degrees. 
and mix my dough out, and it's going to be cold. And what I'm looking for is a finished dough temperature down around 60 degrees, or eh, right around 60 is about would be a good. And then lightly oil the bowl. Yeah, after mixing, you can take the dough out if you want, lightly oil the container, put it back into that container, whatever you're going to be bulk fermenting in, and just lightly covering it. And don't try to lid it tight or anything, just drape a piece of plastic over that container. That's all you need. Uh, what are you fermenting in, bulk fermenting in? Uh, it was just a, like a, a plastic container. Like a Cambry yeah. container yeah. or something. All right. And does that dough ferment to the top of it or halfway up? or? Uh, Okay, so you're going to have to temp it, just lightly cover it. And you got a couple things working for you. First of all, a byproduct of yeast fermentation is CO2, carbon dioxide. CO2 is heavier than air, so it blankets. It's called the greenhouse effect, okay? We're all familiar with that. It blankets the top of the dough with CO2, which is a protective layer. It actually helps to prevent the dough from drying out. And that's the good news. The bad news is that if there's a draft, it can blow it away. So now the dough could dry out. So you still want to tent it, and that'll help it prevent that draft. All right. So just lay it over the top, tent it, and you're good. The next morning, go ahead, turn it out of the bowl, ball it up, and you're good to go. Forget the fridge. It's okay. really not helping it's any. Just waste the extra yeah. Okay. And it, you're going to find that you're going to get much better fermentation. Because right now, you've actually got two doughs coming out of the fridge. One. Outside dough and the inside dough. Exactly because the outside dough is cooler than the inside dough. Yes. And we used to see a lot of that, oh gosh, back in the uh, 60s and early 70s when everybody was bulk fermenting their doughs in pizzerias because the outer edge would cool down, the inner side was warm. And now when they would make their, their pizzas from that, the inside edge, the yeast was more active. It was a lower pH, okay? Acidity inhibits crust color, so it makes it more difficult to, to brown. Also, where you've got higher temperature, you've got more yeast fermentation, more yeast activity. The yeast is feeding more, so you've got lower sugar, residual sugar. That around the edge has a higher pH, more residual sugar, so it browns more. So all of a sudden, I've got a crust that's real blotchy, dark and light, and it's all over the board. So anyhow, I, that's the way I would handle it. Yeah. Yeah, if you fold it enough, if if you start folding it enough, yeah, you can. One every couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. And then is there no place for cold rest? I'm going back to what you were saying about bringing the batch out of the mixer and immediately shaking it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Is there no advantage at all? So I can ride too long. <laughs> A using bowl rest, if you are balling it. I can come up with 101 reasons why you shouldn't. Okay. And I can't come up with any good ones why you should. Now, if you're not, if you're not going to hold it, if you're not going to ball it and hold it in the fridge, it, it's a different game. It's entirely different. That's a different story. And I think this, this is where that comes from. Here's the reason why. During bowl rust, this is where you take the dough and you mix it, and you, you pull the mixing agitator out your hook, and you might cover it and just leave it set in the bowl for an hour and firm it. And then we take it to the bench and we roll it out of the bowl and then we, we scale it, we ball it. What's happening to it in the bowl? What's it doing? It's growing. It's fermenting. It's becoming less dense. It's becoming more airy, right? Okay. What did we say about when something becomes less dense, more open, more porous, more airy? It becomes a better what? Insulator. So it's a better insulator. It is now more difficult to cool the dough. So you just made your job of dough management more difficult. If not... Oh, 10 minutes bowl rest? Yeah, 10-15 minutes. Yeah. Don't need it. Uh, yeah. And again, how long did I say the rule is for the time it comes off the mixer? 20 minutes. And the reason why we, 20 minutes is the number is because yeast, when you woke up this morning, the alarm clock went off, right? Did you ever notice that when the alarm clock goes off and it wakes you up out of a deep sleep? Why, you are 100% alert and active and you're ready to go, right? Yeah, right. I can tell you how I felt this morning when it went off. It was like, oh, God, what was that? <laughs> 
it takes you a few minutes to kind of organize your thought patterns, right? All right, yeah. Yeah, I'm good to go, got a pulse. All right, so you're eroding that 20 minute period of time because now your dough is beginning to ferment and how long does it take you to cut your dough? Give me a number. From the time, 20 minutes, okay. So now it's already got time on it. And so part of your dough is gonna be more dense when it's balled up, it's gonna cool down faster. The other part's not going to be. And you're gonna be calling me and you're gonna say, I can't figure out what's going on here. Uh, some of my dough balls are really nice and others are just difficult to open up. I don't know what's happening. Some of them fill the box and other ones don't. That's d definitely a temperature issue. That's why I don't like to do that. Now, if you're going to say, Tom, no, we don't go through a refrigeration process. You know, we just go ahead, we mix it. Can we give it 10 minutes, an hour of bowl rest? Turn it out and ball it? Sure. Put it up on the trays cover them up, let them ferment, and then start using them two hours down the road or something like that, not a problem. It's, not going, it's perfectly fine. But if you're going to refrigerate them, the fact that you've got a variation in dough density means that you're going to have a variation in the rate that you can cool those dough balls down, and it's that inconsistency that's going to come back to haunt you. You follow that one? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It makes sense? It does. When, when you final shape. So any kind of thin spots. I mean you're you're explaining to me why we're getting thin spots. So when you when you you say when you're doing your first are you doing it a first fold as soon as it comes out of the mixer? Well it, it, again it depends on who's working with <laughs> But ideally it's been ten minute bowl rest, goes on the bench, gets a first shape, two, three folds, goes on the tray until you're done with that batch then. Okay. Now, what are you balling it though, or are you balling it? Because I didn't, hear, I didn't hear you say anything about. I heard you say folds, but folding is not balling. Right. Right. The final shape comes after everything has been. Okay. First yeah. Yeah. And then, do you cold ferment after that for a period of time? Yeah. You, eliminate that process. I'd, I'd, I'd completely eliminate it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that some people find helps a little bit. Uh, if, especially if they, if you tend to be working with a higher absorption dough, uh, do you know what your absorption is? Anywhere from 60 to 60. You're, you're within the normal range. Uh, maybe with some flowers, if you're, if you're in that upper range, 66, 68 uh, percent, some people may find that their dough, depending upon the flower, might be a little, little bit on the sticky side right after mixing, and you're better off then just turning the dough out on the bench. Uh, and now you got a blob on the bench, and what I do is I just simply take one end of that dough and I pick it up and I kind of fold it over a couple of times onto itself, and then I roll it over upside down, and you're going to find that you got a nice, smooth, dry skin on the bottom, or which is now facing up. It's a lot easier to handle. And it just that extra step, but how long did that take? About as long as it took me to explain it. <laughs> and that's not going to impact anything. But yeah, there's what we're faced with today is, I, I'm not saying that there's a lot of false information out there, but you have to know the whole story. And sometimes we don't get the whole story. Somebody grabs a piece of it and runs with it and tries to implement it. And, uh, then all of a sudden you start seeing problems that you, you just don't have an explanation for. You had a, another question over here. <laughs> oh, the dough line. Okay, great question. You know what we refer to that as fondly? The dreaded gum line. Okay. Yeah, the dreaded gum line. Okay, when, when we see a dreaded gum line, the reason why we call it the dreaded gum line is because there's probably about eight or ten different things that can cause it. Some of them are interrelated, but until you find the right one, it won't go away. <laughs> and it can really be, prove to be problematic. Uh, this is when you look right underneath the uh, sauce, uh, and the only way, real way to identify it. I had one guy tell me, we just can't get rid of it. It won't go away. 
and everything we tried doesn't help. And uh, it's always there. I said, send me a picture of it. So he sent me a picture of a slice that he'd cut using a pizza wheel. He said, see, there it is. You can see it right underneath the sauce. And I said, yeah. What you just did is drove the cheese and the sauce down across the dough, and you crimp cut it. You created what we call a false gum line. There's only one or way to tell if you've got a real false line, a real uh, gum line or not, and not a false gum line, and that is to cut out a slice of your pizza, cut out a wedge of it, turn it upside down, and take a box knife, just a real sharp razor knife, and carefully cut it all the way down, all the way from the rim, all the way down to the point, and then either fold it or pull it in half. And then you can look at it, because when you cut it from the bottom, you don't pull the sauce and the cheese and everything down over that cut area. And now you can plainly see if you've got it or not, and it'll show up as a gray line right underneath the sauce. Okay, If you've got that, welcome to the dreaded gum line. All right. What can cause it? A whole bunch of things. One, sauce. Okay. And I think I could probably write, in fact, I never needed to write a book on the gum line one time. Uh, sauce can cause it. Over thinned, thinning the sauce out too much. Um, a good sauce is, it's only about 12% solids, 13% solids. The rest is all water. A bad sauce is going to be, 90% water. So you start thinning it down. Uh, do you happen to put onion and garlic into your sauce? Okay. Anybody here put onion and garlic into their sauce? Uh, onion and garlic are, are both catalysts for, for the pectin in the tomato and will cause the tomato pectin to gel. So now you put onion and garlic into your sauce and you come back to it and you look at it the next day and you say, huh. Did we make tomato jelly yesterday? No, why? Well, this must be our pizza sauce then. Because you can stand a spoon up in it, it'll stand up perfectly straight because you just gel it. And then, so what do you do in order to get spreading consistency back to it? Add water to it. So you're just thinning it out some more. Take, do this once. I don't know anything about your sauce, I've never seen it before. But do this to see if your sauce is creating the problem. It works every time. Take a saucer, just a china saucer or something. You can use one of those chinette plates too. Just don't use a one of those raw paper plates, you know. But use something that's got a really smooth surface, non-absorbent surface. And take a, a spoonful, a ladle of your sauce and put it right in the middle of it. Just drop it right in the middle. And come back to it in 15 minutes and look at it. If you see water accumulating, riv rivulets of water, just building up around the side of it. Sometimes you'll even see water flowing away from your sauce. You got too much water in your sauce. What If it's doing it on the plate, what do you think it's going to do on the pizza? The same thing. Okay. Go do the same thing. Now, to add insult to injury, anybody in here ever use a propane torch and some solder to solder copper pipe? Anybody ever do that? Okay. When you solder a, a joint using a propane torch and, and solder, do you apply heat to the spot where you want the solder to go, or do you apply it underneath it? And does not the heat suck the solder in? Am I, am I right? Yeah, it does. It draws it in. So the solder migrates to the heat source. Okay? From which side are peaches baked, top or bottom? They're baked from the bottom up. So what heats up first, the top or the bottom? The bottom. So now the bottom is heating up. Remember that water that's been released from the sauce now? Yeah, when that dough begins to heat up underneath it, it has an affinity and it's drawn down into the dough. And then it tries to bake off. And in order to bake off, it's got to evaporate some of that water off. But whoops. We've got cheese and we've got pepperoni, we've got sausage and we've got vegetables. We've got everything on top of it. There's no way for it to evaporate off. So there it's stuck. Huh. We just made a pasta layer right underneath our sauce, gum line. That's, that's how you tell if your sauce is at fault. Okay. Another, another thing that can cause it, when you open up your skins into pizza skins, open up those dough balls, do you do it by hand, press, or uh, sheeter? 
How do you make? How do you form your skins? You use a sheeter. Uh, sheeter. If you're sheeting them out to full diameter, they are notorious for creating a gum line. They're notorious for that. Um, now, so, so that mean that ooh, I've got to throw out my sheeter and do something else? No. But here's here's something to try. Just try this once. Open up your skin. Just sheet it out. Form it out. Are, are you baking in an air impingement or a deck oven? Okay, air impinger. You're baking on a on a disc or on a screen? On a disc? Okay. Well, either one doesn't make any difference. But what I want you to do after you after you 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 shape your skin, put it on a screen, and I want you to set it off on the side for ten minutes. Just set it off. On, don't don't do a thing to it. Don't sauce it. Don't do a thing to it. Just set it off on the side for at least ten minutes. 15, fine. Then I want you to come back to it. I want you to sauce it, bake it off. What's going to happen during those 10 or 15 minutes? It's going to begin to ferment a little bit, okay? So it's going to begin to open up a little bit, and it's actually going to gain a little bit in thickness. You're going to see an improvement in oven spring, and that, believe it or not, helps to eliminate that gum line from a sheeted crust. There is a method that we developed that addresses that, it's, it's a little bit different, but we use the sheeter and we open up the dough ball using the sheeter. We open up the gap in the rolls and we open up the dough ball so it's about two inches less than what we want. So if you're targeting a 12 inch uh, skin, you're only going to open it up to about 10 inches in diameter using your sheeter. So now your dough is thicker. You say, yeah, but gee, it's only 10 inches and it's too thick. Don't worry, because now we're going to use our hand and we're just going to manually Open it up to 12 inches and try that once. Now, I'll bet you that'll solve the problem completely. We know it does, if that's the cause. Now, I'll take it another step back. We're going to drill down even lower. Uh, in an air impingement oven, it can happen in your oven if you are baking your product improperly. And improperly in an air impingement oven could be that you're baking it too fast. May I ask, what is your baking time? Six minutes, it's not your baking time. It's not your baking time. What is too fast? Uh, I've seen people bake pizzas four minutes, four and a half minutes in an air impingement oven. It's brown, it's brown, it meets all the visual descriptors. If, if I throw a steak onto a grill at a thousand degrees on both sides, will it not be brown on both sides? And when I stick it with a fork, it does what? It hemorrhages. So is it really done? And the answer is, not for me, it's not. <laughs> and that's really what you're doing. If you crank up that, if you can crank up that temperature, you know, to 500 degrees on an air impingement oven, and have maybe three or four percent sugar in your dough, and zip it through, yeah, it's nice and brown on the outside. And I'll, I'll share this with you. I will bet money that your pizza, when it comes out of the oven, is crispy, but the minute it sits for a minute or so, it's no longer crispy. Is that correct? Yeah. Slow your oven down, just experimentally. Well, what, what oven do you have? You got a newer Lincoln? Okay, bring your temperature down to uh, uh, 480, 475, 480. Uh, set your time at at least five and a half minutes. Do you have sugar in your dough? Obviously, you don't, okay? Because they're gonna say, don't have sugar in your dough. Sounds like you do. But no eggs, no milk, or anything else? Okay. But you gotta, you gotta speed, uh, slow down that baking. Yeah. yeah. Question? I have a question. So, uh, let's say that I, I made and rolled the dough on a Thursday night, put it in the cooler, cooler uh, 40, 45 degrees temperature. I'm gonna use it, this dough on a Friday night, but I want to leave uh, some uh, pieces of dough open with sauce and cheese, kind of pre-made for uh -huh. a busy night. Uh, for how long can I leave this okay. pre-made pizza? Okay, great outside? great question. He wants to stage his, his pre-opened uh, skins. He wants to sauce them, uh, and it doesn't make any difference if you cheese them or not, but he wants to open the skins, open the dough balls in the skins, 
and he wants to sauce them and pre-stage them for when he gets slammed a little bit later, okay? What to do, what to do, how long can I do that? And a lot of people do that. There's nothing wrong with it. However, there, there is a step that you can take that will help you. One, uh, make sure that you're not overly thinning out your sauce. So some people might say a, a thicker sauce or richer sauce, however you want to express it. Uh, that works fine. Number two, always, if you're going to pre-sauce, always a very, very light application of oil to the surface of the dough before you put the sauce on. What do we know about oil and water? Okay. They, they repulse each other. So if you have the oil over the surface of the dough, any moisture that might be released from that sauce will not go into the dough, which would create the problem that the gentleman down here has got with a gum line. So it's not going to contribute to it. It'll help you with that. And how long can you leave it go? Uh, you can. You keep. Are you keeping them under refrigeration or room temperature? Room temperature, about eighty-five degrees. Yeah, room temperature. I'll be honest with you. Thirty minutes would be the max. And and I tell you why. It's it's not that I'm having a problem with the sauce and, and interacting with the dough. It's just the fact that the dough is fermenting at eighty-five degrees. So your pizza base is going to be changing. That's going to be the issue, not the pre-saucing. So half an hour limitation because of fermentation. Uh, refrigerated? Uh, refrigerated, you could probably go a couple hours. Can I use a spray? No, no. Can you use a spray? <laughs> I, I, and I say that very emphatically, no. <laughs> and, I, and I tell you why. When you brush it on real thin, when you're putting oil onto something, when you're putting oil onto something, does it make a difference if you can just see a shine or if you just pour it on? And the answer is no. It doesn't make it. As long as the oil is there, mission accomplished. When you spray it on, you always, always get more buildup. So you're getting much more oil. And here's what's going to happen when you get too much oil. You, get, you flood the surface with oil by spraying it. You get too much oil on. You put your sauce on and everything looks good, right? And so now we get busy and we start uh, pulling those out and we start cheesing them and dressing them and baking them off. And then we watch our customers eating them. And they take a slice and the pizza looks, oh, it looks awful good. They take a bite, they slide into it, and they do this. And everything slides off the slice into their lap. Houston, we've got a problem and we can't figure out why. Well, I'll tell you why. Oil is a pretty good lubricant, right? It creates a slip surface. Oil doesn't go away. It doesn't evaporate. It stays there. So it stays there as a fine layer of oil to which all of the toppings can just slide off. That's why I'm very emphatic when I say, no, don't spray it. It's just too easy to get way too much on. When I say brush it, I mean if you hold it up to the light and if you can see a little bit of shine, some people might call it dry brushing even. Just barely get that oil up. You're good to go. Yeah. Uh, what effects does altitude and uh, geographical regions have on dough? What effect does altitude and like, geographical? Like I made dough in Denver, it's different from making it in San Diego. Yeah. I noticed that because I work at both same age. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I, I've made pizza every place from Miami, Florida, all the way to Quito, Ecuador, where we're at over 10,000 feet, and uh, everything in between. As you go up in elevation, a couple things happen. We have a lower atmospheric pressure. And most people say yeast ferments faster at higher altitudes. No, it doesn't. It ferments at the same speed. Then why does the dough get bigger? Because there's less pressure pushing down on it. Same pressure, it just gets bigger, that's all. So what we see looks like more fermentation, but it's still fermenting at the same rate. That's important to know because if we're fermenting for flavor development, we still have to ferment for the same length of time. Okay, or may actually have to ferment longer. So keep that in mind. You may get more oven spring. If you're getting more oven spring off of it, the first thing I might do is maybe thin out my dough a little bit, cut back on my dough weight slightly. I could also trim back on the amount of yeast that I'm using. So reduce my yeast amount slightly. I might increase my fermentation time. Uh, Again, uh, if you're just going by 24 hours, 
you might change that to maybe 30 hours with a lower yeast level. You're going to get the same flavor, longer fermentation, but you're not going to get as much oven spring. So your product is going to look closer to the same. The other, the other thing I would do is I would increase my, my dough absorption, my water. Uh, more, water more water by 2%. Why, why would I add 2% more water? What, do, what happens, what's the boiling point of water at Denver in Denver versus Miami? Water at higher elevation, it's a lower boiling point. Uh, water is boiling at about 200, and, stand to be corrected, 24, 205 in Denver versus 212 in Miami. Okay, so I, I'm going to get more loss, more evaporative loss. So I need to increase my absorption a little bit. And then watch your baking time. Watch your baking time. Your baking times generally tend to be a little bit longer at high elevation. I've noticed that too. Yeah. It takes a lot longer. Yeah, and how much longer I can't say because all ovens are different. But uh, in most air impingement ovens that I've worked with, the number is something between a minute and two minutes longer. And when you bake it longer, <laughs> you got cheese on the top, all right? And that cheese responds to temperature and bake time by getting darker. So if your cheese is getting too darker, then you may have to go back to the oven manufacturer and get a different finger for the top that's going to flow less air to the top. Because your, your peaches are all baking from the bottom. Yeah. So you, the top, those top fingers, the only thing they're there for is the control top color. That's, that's yeah, to it. Make, to make it even from the bottom. Yeah. So, you, and that's the best way to do it. So I normally say, you know, adjust that color by going with a different finger. You could manipulate time temperature. It's a balancing act. It may or may not work. It's a lot easier just to do it with adjustment with the finger, which brings up a good point. If you're ever going to buy an oven, know where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're down in San Diego and you're buying an oven, and the guy says, oh, yeah, this, now this oven here served the last owner very, very well. And you say, well, where was he at? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the guy says, Quito, Ecuador. Oh, okay, let's see. That oven may have a different finger configuration than what I need. Take that into account. We had another question over here. Go ahead, grab this one. Active dry or ADY versus ADY? Okay, active dry, ADY versus IDY. Uh, both good. Both work very well. Uh, my preference is always for the IDY, instant dry yeast. Why? Because active dry yeast, before you can use it, it, it has to be activated. Okay? And you activate it in 100 to 105 degree water. Who's going to be temping the water? How are they going to temp? Oh, yeah, that's 105. Good. We're ready to go. Um, or are you going to use a thermometer? That's the way it should be done. Uh, if you temp it in a raw water temperature, you can get all kinds of funky fermentation times taking place. Either faster or slower, you can get slacker dose sometimes, but you're not going to know what's happening. It's an extra step. I don't know about you, but in the shop, I'm not looking for extra things to do. <laughs> I mean, I want things to be a simple straight line forward as possible. And if I can avoid having Having to uh, activate my active dry yeast, I will do that by switching over to IDY. And how do you use IDY? You open up the bag. And oh, by the way, it's got a real good indicator if the yeast is really good or not. And the fact is that it comes in a brick. It's a vacuum-packed brick. If that brick is firm and hard, we've got good yeast. And if it isn't, don't do a thing. Just set it off on the side. And the next time your yeast supplier comes in, hand it back to them and say, here, give me a good one. This one's soft. And they'll exchange it out. It happens. And so with instant dry yeast, IDY, how do you use it? Just sprinkle it right on top of the flour. You don't need to stir it in. You don't need to do anything. Just sprinkle it right in and go for it. <laughs> the only time when you don't do that is if you have an extremely short mixing time or if you're hand mixing a dough for any reason. Uh, I've only come across one place that actually hand-mixed dough. Um, but um, if you're using a VCM, vertical cutter mixer, uh, anybody in here use a VCM mixer? You'll know if you've got one because your mixing time was to be measured in seconds, like uh, 70, 75 seconds only. 
And with that, there's not enough time to completely disperse the IDY. So it doesn't make any difference if it's ADY or IDY. They both have to be put into 100 degree water, suspended. The active dry yeast has to wait 10 minutes. The IDY just suspend it and pour it in. You get your question? The ID, oh yeah, yeah, because the way, because he he was uh, activating it, and if you're using IDY, there's no reason to activate it. It's just an extra step. Yeah. Question. Do you always recommend the freshman dough ball with oil for cross hacking? I do. Yeah. Now, it does two things. One, uh, it prevents a crust from forming over the top of the dough during that cross stack period. And that's, I think that's an important feature. And two, if your dough is being properly managed, those dough balls, I say, should be kissing for about two inches. There should be about a two-inch spot where the dough balls come together. And because they've been oiled, most of the time you can just pull them apart. They just come apart. You don't need to cut them apart. And, and that can be an important feature for your guys if they're you know, in a hurry. You don't have to cut them out and lift them. Yeah. So I just like, and you don't have to use EVO, extra virgin olive oil. Uh, just use canola oil. I mean, it's, and just a very light brushing, very light application of it. Again, I don't like to spray it. I've seen people spray them, and <laughs> the oil is just dripping off the dough balls. That's way, it's a waste. No, what about underneath the dough balls? Don't put it underneath the dough balls. Um, the reason why you don't want to put it underneath the dough balls is because now the dough balls uh, will play a hockey game in there. And you're going to pick up that dough box and you're going to tip it a little bit. And all the dough balls are going to rush over to that side of the box. <laughs> and if you don't set it down and reposition them, in the morning what you're going to have is you're going to have one big mass of dough on one side of the box. So it's awful hard to, to keep them separated. That's the only reason, yeah. And so, yeah, just leave it dry. Uh, they, they pick right off the bottom real easily. Uh, if you, downstairs on the floor, I, I haven't had much chance to look down there, but WRH Plastics, uh, they also, they, they make the dough boxes, but they've got plastic scrapers that are used for removing the dough balls from the box. You're familiar with those? And they're great for cleaning the dough boxes. Good grief. I mean, a little bit of dough that clings to it, leave it dry out. Right, wipe it down, and then I just wipe it, wipe it out with a with a clean bar towel, one and through, and they're good to go. Another round. You had a question here? Um, yeah, for you had kind of mentioned it, so I, I think the answer is yes. But maybe the best way to do it, if you want to kind of pre get some skin, it's like I do a ten inch pizza. But if I want to at least get them out to five or six inches in advance, how early can I do that, and then how do I prevent them from sticking to each other, or how do I okay. manage that? <coughs> because uh, because you do not have refrigeration for that, you're gonna, you, there's no way you can stack them. Even with something between them, it won't work. Okay. So what you're going to have to do is you can buy these. Um, oh, American Metalcraft. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with that company, yeah. they sell wire tree racks okay. and stack them up vertically. And just go ahead and put those skins onto a screen. Okay. And just use a regular old pizza screen. Just lightly oil it, just open up your skins part way, put it on top of that, and stack them up on that, and then slip a, uh, a food contact approved plastic bag over that, and you're good to go. Okay. They, how long can you keep them on that? You can keep them on that an hour, okay. hour and a half. Now, when you go to use them... Will they be, it'll be sticky or no? No. Now, when you go to use them now, what you're going to do is you're going to take that screen and you're going to tip it off of the screen... Now, it's been partially open, right? Yep. Do you, ha you hand open your dough balls. Yes. You're going to find that those, those dough balls are so partially open. They just open up like butter. Yeah. They're going to be super easy, super fast to open. And you're going to say, why haven't I done this before? Yeah. Then you're going to say, it's a good thing I went to Pizza Expo and learned that. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a follow-up to that because you had mentioned the screens. Is there, and I know some people cook it on screen, some people cook it right on the brick. Is there a big difference in the end product of one? Yeah. Setting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Baking on, baking on a screen, like a pizza screen, expanded uh, wire mesh screen, versus baking right on the deck. All right. 
if you if you put your hand into a deck oven, 500 degrees, will you get burned? And the answer is no. We all do it all the time. So as long as you don't touch anything, the minute you touch something, you're going to get burned instantly. All right. So when you put it right on the deck, you transfer all that heat into the crust, and you get a lot of oven spring very fast. But when you put it on the screen, there is an air gap between that hot deck and your crust. So it tends to bake more slowly. You don't get quite as much oven spring. It's a slightly more dense crust. Some people will actually take it and lift it off of the screen after maybe two minutes or so of baking. And then it's called decking it. They'll put it right on the deck. And they get a better crust color. We've got a... This will be the last question. We've got, we've got another group right behind That's us. What you were saying, can you do it the other way? Can you put it on the stone first and then screen it? Will it work the same way? It doesn't work the same way, but if you need to bake your pizza longer, the yeah. answer is yes. Okay, cool. If you have a wood-fired oven, you know, maybe where your deck is at uh, seven, 800 degrees, then, and, and you've got a, maybe a thick crust pizza or a thicker crust that you need more baking time, put it on a screen. Okay. And bake it mostly on the screen and then take it off the screen right on the deck for the last minute or so. Okay, that sounds all right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amy Griffin from Roseville, Michigan. Oh, okay. I have a quick question. Yeah. I'll just talk about pizza boxes. We still do the stainless steel trays, dough balls, and saran wrap over the top. Is there uh -huh. an advantage to the pizza boxes or the dough boxes? Or no. is it just, no? Okay. No, in fact. I, I mean, we don't have a problem, but. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, just the fact that I, I, making sure you get it in there quickly. I mean, we, yeah. did, we did thirty minutes, so twenty minutes. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you got a lot of cleanup to do. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I like to. I, I I'm a firm believer in plastic bagging, or do, but getting eighteen by twenty six bun pans and putting everything on a bun pan, and then slipping a plastic that's bag over use. that. We just use saran wrap. Yeah, I don't like saran wrap, and I tell you why: because it makes an airtight seal. Yeah, it plastic does. bag does not make an airtight seal. An airtight seal makes a dead airspace. Dead yeah. airspace is an excellent insulator. See where I'm going? So use the pla use plastic yeah. bags instead. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. And you can reuse the plastic bag, by the way. Yes, thanks so much. Just don't let it get out. And you have to use control. clear ones. The health department doesn't want yep. black ones. You bet. Yeah, they look too much like a trash bag. Is there such thing as a dough capulator? Uh, I mean, how do I know if I want to make my dough, say, 75%? What does is, what is the formula do so? No, uh, you just want to make a smaller size dough. Yeah, right. Then you just need to know baker's percent. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there are dough calculators out there. In fact, you should be, probably be able to Google it.